Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Thanks for joining us again on Celebrating Act Two uh, with my business partner, Art Kirsch, is our uh, special guest and our regular contributor for food and travel, John Mariani. Welcome, John. Good morning. I, you know, John, I uh, want to ask you a question. I'm reading with fascination. Uh, having, I grew up in Brooklyn, but you know, I'm a New Yorker through and through. We're all New Yorkers uh, at our root. And uh, this love and pizza, what a great piece. It just it captures. A, how did you get inspired to do that? It's a great slice, is what you meant to say. A slice of life. It's more it's than slice a slice of, pizza. of It's yeah. not okay, more than on. a slice of life. It's the whole pizza. That's right. I poured everything I know about pizza <laughs> and love into love and pizza, my novel. Mm, mm, good. And you eat it with your hand and you have to fold it over. And oh, bring yeah. It. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, just for the rest of the country. And it's thin crust novel. Uh, uh, we, no. we could get do that another time about what makes a great pizza thin, thick, <laughs> Yeah, call uh, me. You're, you're out of your element here. I'm sorry. <laughs> so tell but, us about the novel. Yeah. Tell Come us on, about well, the novel. The novel it is it's called Love and Pizza, and it is at the moment being serialized in my uh, newsletter, Mariani's uh, Virtual Gourmet news Newsletter, which is free to all your viewers if they go to johnmariani.com. And I've published, I guess, uh, eight chapters, but you can hit the archive and start from the beginning. Um, and Love and Pizza came about because all my life I've written mostly nonfiction books, encyclopedias, histories, so forth. I wrote a memoir growing up in the Bronx with my, my brother. Um, but I'd never attempted a romantic novel, uh, especially about a woman. I just wanted to see if I could do it. So I knew I had to draw on stuff that I did know very, very well, um, intimately. Um, and um, growing up in the Bronx, which is where it takes place, and about an Italian-American girl from whom I knew plenty, um, and pizza, uh, which I know even more. And then, frankly, the, the other things that uh, in my life have become, have always been very important to me and I have an avid interest in, which includes, and I'll tell you how this develops in the book, which includes uh, not only food, but uh, art and the Renaissance and uh, traveling through Milan, which is a great city, and the whole fashion industry there. Um, that's all in the book. So, But really, I wanted to see if I could write what they call chick lit, um, a, a woman's book, um, <laughs> quite seriously, but have it full of food. Um, and that's something that she is torn by, my heroine, uh, whether to stay in the Bronx and um, uh, where she's quite happy with her big family and her brothers in the restaurant business. And she could live there happily ever after and marry some a nice Italian-American boy. Or <clears throat> she could expand her horizons and um, go off to Italy and be involved in, um, in the art world because um, she's in graduate school at uh, Columbia University, where I went to graduate school. And um, and then everything takes, as a good novel does, takes a big twist, a big right turn, and a couple of love affairs. So that's what it is and why why I wrote it. I wanted to see if I could do it. Well, the, thing that I, the, the thing that I found remarkable about it, uh, as you said, as chick lit, is that we know you and we speak to you frequently, and I always hear your voice. It's just, you're, you're a wonderful storyteller. Okay, but you you tell stories about wine and and food and 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 locations, and so when I started reading it, I'm hearing your voice, but it's from a a, a young, at least the, the parts that I'm getting through, a young girl growing up into uh, at least uh, her college years, and as a guy, I wasn't sure because I don't have that experience of is this a, a gal's voice, but it sounded like. It was written by a woman, so it was one of the questions I was going to ask you is that you actually have like a ghost wife or a ghost yeah. daughter or a ghost friend write the or check the uh, uh, the vernacular of the gals because it, uh -huh. it sounded authentic, but there was no way for me to know. But it didn't sound like a guy being a gal. So how did you well, do that? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. A couple of uh, answers. I, I wrote a book um, a while ago which was a Christmas book called uh, The Hound in Heaven. 
and uh, it was about a, a dog and his and this family in Maine, and I need not get into that. But there's a lot about dogs in that book. So my agent, when he got the manuscript, he says, oh, I love this book. This is great. He says, what kind of dog did you own? And I said, I've never owned a dog. I don't even like dogs all that much. He said, well, how could you write a, so persuasively about a, a dog? And I said, because that's what writers do. We make it up on the basis of research. And I did a lot of research about dogs for that book. Okay, so this was much easier to write about Love and Pizza and this uh, young Italian girl. I knew I would not put it in the first person because I think that would have been a little bit forced trying to sound like an Italian-American girl in the Bronx in 1985. So I knew I had to do it as a third-person narrator uh, myself uh, without intruding because there are, there are um, narrators. The most flagrant example would be somebody like... Um, uh, well, Ernest Hemingway, even to a certain sense, that he's definitely in all of his books, his character, his spirit, even in his, in, in his, in his fiction. Um, so I wasn't going to have that. I wanted it to be a fairly straightforward and romantic kind of writing, which was based on the reality of growing up in the Bronx and the Arthur Avenue section of the Bronx. And what people should, as, as, as I extol in the book about the Bronx, um, that it is not all the Fort Apache crime-ridden, drug-addicted uh, borough that has been led to people led to believe, and especially in 1985 when this book takes place. Um, the North Bronx, which is where the botanical gardens are, <clears throat> which is where the Bronx Zoo is, and the reason that the Italians came there—I think I mentioned this on another show—the reason the Italians came there from. Sicily and Naples and so forth, because they were stone workers who worked on the botanical gardens and the Bronx Zoo. So they had to live there in the neighborhood, which is Fordham. Fordham University is right across the street. Um, Fordham Road runs right straight through it all the way to uh, the Hudson River and all over the Long Island Sound. So I knew the, the area well, and I wanted to tell a story of a neighborhood, i.e. Belmont or Arthur Avenue, uh, which is the safest precinct in all of New York, um, because the Italians took care of it, and because the, it's very, very family-oriented, and it's a nice place to grow up. I, I grew up somewhat um, uh, east of there, uh, towards the Long Island Sound, in another section. Um, but I, so want, I wanted to tell this tale of a neighborhood the way, um, well, it's interesting. You know the, the movie The Bronx Tale, sure. which Robert De Niro directed? And was in, <clears throat> and um, that was written by Chaz Palmentieri, the actor, who grew up in Arthur Avenue. Um, that's his neighborhood, and that's what a Bronx Tale was about. Um, a little bit more fantasy, um, and it was about the mob, or the, uh, the the local mobsters in that neighborhood uh, coming up against. Um, does a child in that neighborhood, a boy in that neighborhood, uh, gravitate towards that? lifestyle, um, or does he um, do something better with his life? Um, wonderful, wonderful movie. One, he started out as a one-man play. So mine is about a woman. Now, she's, she's quite beautiful. She um, uh, is very, very intelligent, and she's devoted to the arts. So as you find out when the story opens, it's 1985, and um, she's quite happy in the neighborhood, and she's going to Columbia University um, studying art, art history. And she has a real inclination for that, and she has her dreams, and she has a couple of sisters and brothers. One of the brothers is in the restaurant business. He buys a, a restaurant in Arthur Avenue there, and he has uh, another sister who only wants to be a mother and have children and stay in the neighborhood, and another girl who's younger who's kind of spry and, and, and funny. And then there's Nicola, and Nicola Santini is my heroine. And Nicola is told by her grandmother right on the first page, you are better than, not better than your family, but you've got more opportunities. You shouldn't really necessarily stay here. You can do more with your life and never, ever, ever settle for just any Italian-American kid in the neighborhood to marry, if that's your want. So the base of the story is that what does this girl do? Does she follow her dream? which would take her out of the neighborhood, 
um, and would give her a completely different character development as she grew older, or does she stay, what do you say, to, chained to, tied to, lovably um, connected to um, her neighborhood and her past? And um, it's not the old, it's not the newest story in the world because all what they call what novelists call buildings, romans, a story of somebody growing up has been done a thousand times, including by <clears throat> James Joyce and, uh, and Mark Twain. Um, so, but uh, I don't, no one's ever taken it from the point of view that uh, I have about this uh, wonderful girl. And I'll bring you up to chapter eight, only to say that she is on the verge. She has one, uh, well, she's going to Columbia Graduate School and she's getting <clears throat> to go abroad to study Italian art in Italy in Milan. So in by chapter eight, she is at that point, and her, and her father and mother say, this is great, you're only going to be gone a semester, so of course you'll go back to the old neighborhood. Not a problem for us. Um, and uh, she's just about to leave, first time ever in another country, first time really on an airplane, except to visit her relatives in Miami on vacation. So this is a whole new world for this young, very, very smart, but extremely naive in her own way. Um, you know, she's Jenny from the block. She's uh, Nicola from the block. And she's never left the block, really, um, except to go to school. And that's the story of a lot of us. And um, that's what she faces when she gets to Italy, which she hasn't yet. Well, don't spoil it. Don't spoil don't it for us. Well, I just simply to say that things take a real change for the better and the worse. And um, we'll have to see how it turns out. I didn't know while I was writing it. I, I was going to ask you that, whether you whether you blocked out the whole story, built the ending, then went back and filled it in, or whether you just start from scratch and see where it goes. I started from scratch um, and see where it goes. I've done some crime novels too, and I never know where they are going, except that uh, I have, sometimes I just have the title. And Love and Pizza was pretty much the title, so I knew, okay, young girl, Italian American right. girl, smart cookie, Highly intellectual, artistically bent, um, not romantically involved. So that leaves open all sorts of possibilities. Sure. Now, I will tell you something how characters, um, all novelists will tell you this. And to me, it's fascinating because I don't really know what is going to be in the next chapter until I write it. And I don't even know what the dialogue is going to be until I write the next sentence. But every writer will tell you about this miracle whereby your characters after you've created them they start to tell you what they will and will not do so i had a chapter later in uh, later in the book in which she got involved with a guy a, a model a male model from texas and they had a brief love affair the reason i'm telling you this is not the spoiler because i finished it finished the chapter looked at it and immediately ripped it up because Nicola told me she'd never do that. She would never do that. The character would never do that. But I had to write the whole chapter before I found out that Nicola was sitting over me, standing over me back here and saying, no way is that chapter going in this book. So, John, I, I know that uh, growing up Italian in the Bronx and then moving to Westchester where we met, Mm -hmm. um, you are a man who appreciates a good Italian American princess. Is is Nikki Santini? I married a Russian girl. <laughs> <laughs> who who cooks as well as an Italian girl? Oh yeah, oh yeah, very much. <laughs> um, but is is uh, Nikki Santini uh, based on that collective of Italian girls you you knew growing up? Well, to a certain extent. Um, possibly more the extended family, extended Italian American family in my in my home. And um, curiously enough, and I, John Coleman, you can vouch for this. Um, the girls, the Italian American girls, as, as well as the Irish American girls, they're all Catholic girls. They all went to places called academies. They went to Ursuline Academy. <laughs> <laughs> went to Our Lady of Victory Academy. They went to Sacred Heart Academy. And we went to prep school. You know, Iona Prep and Stepanak Prep and so forth. So they were 
slightly snooty in that regard, and, and depending upon the neighborhood you came from. If you're from Larchmont or Rye, forget about it. Those girls are so snooty. So they weren't your typical Italian-American girls. But I did go out with girls who's, who had names like, like Lynn uh, Del Guercio, who was actually my second cousin, and a uh, girl named um, uh, Elaine Mortola, and uh, there was Jody Cerrone. So, yeah, I knew these girls, and um, I knew how they talked. And although that was the 60s when you and I were in our prime, our youthful prime, um, by 1985 I had a lot more experience with Girls, women, Italians, and every other kind. But I married a Russian. <laughs> but, well, let me let me um, let me say this: that I I probably I think I started on chapter seven because I just happened to be on your site, and I'm always watching something interesting in there. And love and peace. And John and I briefly were talking about it. So I said, you know what? Let me go take a look because you had talked about. Uh, in one of our last uh, episodes about uh, writing mm. the novel now that you're in the pandemic and you get it over with or so, some such com- uh, conversation. So I started reading it and because of my introduction to you as the virtual gourmet, as uh, food and fine food and, and enjoying food, what I was taken with besides the artwork, which it seemed like, how do we get there? I, I knew I had missed the first several chapters, uh, but the richness of the descriptions of places and food and yes. everything was absolutely apparent. So, so you had me hooked, and I went back back to the April 29th or something archive. I had to go find out where number one started, and um, I binge read about five chapters. And the thing that struck me early on, which kept me going, was that. Uh, my wife's from the Bronx, uh, Townsend Avenue, 172nd Street. And when she grew up, it wasn't the Bronx that we hear in Fort Apache, as you said, or or uh, as we were growing up, uh, the, the South Bronx was uh, problematic in a well, lot of ways. The Golden Guineas and all those street gangs. Mm-hmm. So in any, she, she uh, was telling me stories as they were growing up. She and her brother uh, or uh, girlfriends would, at night, go to Yankee Stadium. Mm. and oh, walk yeah. by themselves everything was fine and they never had any problems so it gave me that and she was a uh, I guess what you could call a groupie for Dion on the Belmonts her mother used to drag her around to all the Dion concerts and he used to drive around the na- various neighborhoods in his convertible with his own songs blasting out uh, well, so you know, he, you know where he got the uh, you know where he got the name the Belmonts yeah from the, from the section the yeah, yeah. Neighborhood. And he would stand on the uh, corner of 187th Street and uh, Belmont Avenue and invented doo-wop right there, you know. And then, I love you like I do. That was created on a corner right there on Arthur Avenue where my novel takes place. So in any way, the authenticity of your writing, of your capturing of what it felt like growing up in the Bronx, not dissimilar from what my wife grew up and the stories she has regaled me and her other friends about how wonderful it was. And when I first started dating her, she was there. So we would, you know, drive up and down. uh, uh, She was on Townsend Avenue and there were cars always parked on either side with a, a third row of double parked. And we would just go, you know, 30, 40 miles an hour uh, as another car just, you know, scooting down the streets and, and everybody seemed, everything seemed to work. Well, and, yeah, I think yeah. you do, uh, yeah, I can't be myopic. Um, that was the North Bronx that you're describing pretty much. Um, and uh, not too far from there, by the way, in the 1970s and 80s, um, uh, hip hop was created in a rumpus room over near the Hudson River. Um, Anyway, um, as, as was doo-wop in, in Arthur Avenue, there's a lot of rich musical culture there. But the North Bronx was different. It was much more solid. It was much more family-oriented uh, because uh, of the Italians who lived there, and the Irish and the Germans. What happened in the Bronx is that Robert Moses, who was the head of the uh, um, uh, what was a Port Authority, had more but back in the 40s and 50s, had more power than, well, even though God, but even certainly more than the mayor of New York City. What he said, go, if he wanted to create a whole highway system, it was done. He created Jones Beach. 
he created the 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 um, uh, parkway system. And the reason we call parkways is because first of all, you're supposed to get out park and have a picnic by the side. So they're never straight. They are winding because they're lovely, lovely roads. And they always went through parks and they were supposed to connect every park. So he did some great, wonderful things like that. Um, he was behind the World's Fair, the 1939 World's Fair, of course. And um, then he never, he, he didn't have a license himself, Robert Moses, but uh, didn't drive a car. He had a driver. And he would, um, he decided that he was going to link the George Washington Bridge on the west side of the Bronx to the Long Island Sound and to the bridges there, the, the um, um, Whitestone Bridge and the Throgs Neck Bridge. And what that meant was to cut, gut, really, gut the belly of the Bronx to the hardest rock on earth, Nisus Rock, uh, as Manhattan is too. You got to really, big, and you got to go down and the engineer said this is crazy and he says i don't give a rap do it now what happened and we're talking about the 1950s that would be the cross bronx expressway right cross bronx expressway right. exactly yeah. and what that did was he sent about 1950 51 before a spade went to the ground he sent around notices condemning all the land on either side of the prospective um um, expressway. Notice he didn't call our parkway because it wasn't going through the parks. Um, and people had to get out. Now at that time, these were largely, there were black neighborhoods, there were Hispanic neighborhoods, but there were always there were Irish neighborhoods, there were German neighborhoods, there were Jewish neighborhoods, Italian neighborhoods, and we all intermingled. We kept our distance um, at the time, um, but we intermingled um, as people do in, 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 in mer as merchants and so forth. But what that did, when, it, when you disembowel an entire borough, and I guess it extends for, what would you say, John, 10 miles from George Washington to... Um, uh, no, it's, okay. it could be closer to 20. Okay. So when you do that, um, all of these people were displaced. All these buildings were condemned. So a lot of the nice buildings in, along which was called the Grand Concourse, for very good reason. Grand Concourse was like six lanes, one of which was built for the carriage trade originally. And they were beautifully landscaped and they had great setbacks and the rooms were large. Um, they were condemned and the landlords indulged in what was then called block busting. And block was, was busting was to deliberately move in. An apartment would open up. They would deliberately move in one or two black or Hispanic welfare families. This sent the rest of the uh, residents, the Irish, the Germans, the Jews, and so forth, reeling because, uh, and they moved, where did they move? They moved north, they moved to Co-op City, they moved to Rockland, they moved to Westchester, they moved to New Jersey, and then moved to Long Island. So in the 1950s, by the time that horrible road was built, um, which is always you know, not now, but uh, always bumper to bumper at this point, that horrible road was built. All of these neighborhoods disintegrated, not in the north, because north was still anchored by the great park, the botanical gardens, um, the uh, Bronx the Bronx parks up there near in uh, City Island, which is pristine, the zoo, um, uh, Fordham University. So that was still rock solid. And by the 1960s and 70s, um, going west from Fordham University, you had the Hispanics, the Latinos moving in, largely Puerto Rican at first because of the Eastern Airline flights from Miami. And at first, the Puerto Ricans were considered just as bad as the blacks. But they're very, very familial and, um, and, and based on family, and they want the kids to get a good education and so forth. So now, and long before now, um, the North Bronx uh, has always been a far safer, far more cultured, uh, far more miscellaneous um, in terms of, of uh, ethnic cultures than the South Bronx, which still has its bad parts, but it's not nearly as bad as it was in 1985. Uh, sure. John, the... Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I was researching that about Irish bars in the Bronx, which you and I used to go to. <laughs> um, you'd find one on every single corner in the Bronx, Castle Hill and places like that. And now I was looking for Irish bars in the Bronx in those same areas, but they don't exist anymore. There's one or two left. 
and now did the bars close or did the names change from, you know, Patty's Irish uh, Grill mm. to uh, Manuel's uh, Mexican uh, uh, well, the, the, Bistro? The, yeah, more the latter because uh, real estate abhors a vacuum. Sure. And consequently, if you take the uh, Irish out of there, the Puerto Ricans are going to go right in. Yeah. Well, let, let's let's save the discussion of how neighborhoods change and how cities develop over generations for another video. Um, and let's get back to your novel, because what I loved about it uh, was the fact that you mixed the worlds of the Bronx, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily Italian-American. The way you described the Bronx could have been the Irish section of the Bronx or the Jewish section of the Bronx. And you mentioned your... your um, your detail, if anybody actually knew what they were reading and knew the, the area, they would say, oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, over there. Oh, yeah. I hope so. as, as art could, as art mm -hmm. could and I could. But um, so you mix the, the, the actual locations with the, I'll call it the culture of the Bronx, mm -hmm. uh, culture of the Italian-Americans and food. And ultimately, you bring in your travel expertise. Yeah. Because don't waste the, anything. Where is she going? Even if, for years, she's talking about going to Italy, the old country, right? Old then, country. if she was Irish, she would go back to Ireland, but the old country. And then you, you're going to take her to where? Milan. Mm -hmm. But she, you know, she's uh, most of the most of the Italians who settled in the Arthur Avenue section were Southern, either Neapolitan and Sicilian. Right. And she comes from that Neapolitan, and those people are looked down upon even today by the Northerners in Milan. And even in Rome and Florence and Venice, yeah. those northerners down below that they're called the Contadini. Yeah, but you you do a great job of mixing different worlds together, little, little demi mondes, and it's a wonderful pastiche. Is that a great? Uh, uh, it is a lot of French words there. Okay. Demi -monde. Now, now, a now you're turning me into my book. All of these things. Excuse yeah. me, you're turning me. You're you're exposing me as Brooklyn because you're. <laughs> I got to look these words up later because I don't want to well, be looking down to the computer. But I, 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 I want to interrupt here for a moment to, to pay uh, John Mariani, for me, an ultimate compliment. When I was growing up as a young, young lad, um, I used to fall asleep every night listening to Gene Shepard. Oh, yeah. And I oh. loved his voice and his storytelling. You are the nonfiction version, for me, of Gene Shepard. Well, thank you. I, I think Gene had a lot of fiction in, in uh, what he talked about, just as um, um, what's a Garrison Kaler does. But uh, yes, anywhere near the realm of those guys. Gene Shepard was a guy who get would get on the radio for what three hours every night yes. and make it up as he went along. Go, mm -hmm. go. No, but but so you you it, it you, just... you but you're really putting in what it, what I was uh, uh, the compliment I'm, I'm handing you. Uh, uh, that you've earned for me is that you are creating a recipe of real life, real places, not like Wobegon or whatever his lake was, uh, mm -hmm. his camp. But you're you're basically stirring, a, creating a recipe of things that are common and people can look at it and know that you were there because they were there and they can tell. Yeah, that's what. Grand Concourse in the Bronx was, or yeah. uh, the Belmont area, or Rome, or all the other wonderful places that you talk about. So, well, when 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 the reader gets to Milan, I can guarantee the same about Milan. Every street I talk about, every cornice, every art gallery, and so forth, uh, is exactly the way it really is because I, I know Milan quite well, and uh, I did a lot of research also. So you can. Um, and also, there, there are scenes that are going to be in Capri, which is in the south, and, and Naples. And I've been to all those places. This is where the travel writing comes mm -hmm. in handy. Um, and I can write it off my taxes. <laughs> John, great novel. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next chapter. Me too. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to read. And uh, we highly Mickey. recommend that, that uh, uh, people go to johnmariani.com. And uh, for the last eight, nine weeks uh, or issues, uh, the second article, I think it is, uh, is a chapter. You're very generously providing a chapter of all the... I remember back in the day, they used to have uh, uh, chapters of books in in uh, some of the, the more widespread magazines. So it's, yep. it's almost harkens to that. And then when do you expect uh, this to be complete as a, uh, a book that people uh, will be able to get? 
We are about one third through. Wow, wonderful. So about 30 chapters, maybe? Roughly yeah. 30 chapters? I mean, none of the, because it is being serialized, every chapter is now between 1,500 and 2,000 words. All so right. that's only about five or six pages. So Easy, the number, this is not easy the, read. Easy fun. read. I, yeah. I dare anybody to start a chapter one and put it down for at least three chapters. You know, if they have an appointment, they have to do. They have to get a Zoom meeting or something. Hard but, to warm in the cockles of my heart, wherever those are. <laughs> and they are fine-looking cockles. Hey, keep it clean. This is a family <laughs> show. All right, guys? Okay. John, thank you so much. And after they go to johnmariani.com and subscribe to the Virtual Gourmet and read Love and Pizza, among all the other things that are in the newsletter, then they will go to youtube.com slash celebrating act two and subscribe to our youtube channel and where they can see this interview and many more with john Mar mariani you can binge watch our binge -watch. conversations with john yes on a playlist it'll be <laughs> great john thanks again appreciate it see you next time see ya For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.